Good morning, Shoreline Church. Whether you're gathered here on campus or you're watching online, thank you for joining us. Well, we're in week eight of our Stand Strong sermon series, where we're walking through the book of 1 Peter. And as we do in this journey, we're learning how to stand strong in our faith as believers in Jesus against the cultural currents that are trying to sweep us away. We're learning how to stand strong against the spiritual battles every day that we're tested And we're learning how to stand strong even against our own selves, the temptations and the the sins that come our way. We're learning how to stand strong. And today we're going to learn how to walk through fire. Now, before any of you call the fire department or you go, Pastor Sean, I'm looking forward to you fire walking up here on stage. I'm going to ask you a question, though. And that is, what does it take to walk through fire? I mean, what does it take to walk through fire? What does it take for these brave firefighters who are fighting against a raging fire? Or how about this? What does it take for the soldier to be able to move under direct fire to be able to survive in combat? And what does it take for this brave law enforcement officer who's standing in the line of fire? What does it take for them to survive? Well, what about these people? What does it take for this group of Indian Christians? These are Christians in India who are gathering to worship together in a small remote village because their homes have been burned down and they've had to move out of the city. Or how about this? What does it take for this woman who's been threatened to be fired from her job because of her Christian faith, because of her old-fashioned Christian beliefs? What does it take for this middle school student who every day walks into school and has to walk through the hallways with jokes and insults fired at him from his classmates? And what does it take for this mother who's walking with her college-age daughter? Her college-age daughter is in a class where the professor is singling her out for her Christian faith. What does it take for each of these people to walk through fire? And although I didn't use any names, these are actual real stories of Christians around the world that are enduring suffering because of their faith in Jesus. And so, but what about you? This morning as I'm up here and sharing God's word with you, what about you? What fire are you walking through this morning? What testing of your faith are you and maybe family members walking through? So this morning, what we're going to do is I want to take you back to 2,000 years ago to another group of Christians who were walking through fire. And they were walking through some horrific fire. And I want to read for you a passage that was written by a Roman historian named Tacitus. And he lived around 55 to 120 AD. And he wrote this about the Christians of that time. He said, for those who follow this Christ, mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skin of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished. Or were nailed to crosses. Or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination in Nero's gardens when daylight had expired. You get that? The Christians were being covered, soaked in oil, placed in cages, suspended in the air, and they were being burned alive in the gardens of Emperor Nero. Tragic. 
And so these Christians, they were not just figuratively walking through fire. They were literally walking through fire, weren't they? Their homes were being burned down and they themselves were being tortured and murdered with fire. And so it's within this context then that we read these words in 1 Peter 4, the apostle Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes these words to the churches that were enduring that. And these words like they did then should bring encouragement to our souls as we walk through the individual fires that we face in our faith. So beginning in verse 12, we read, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Peter continues in verse 14. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. That's like a busybody. Continuing in verse 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? In verse 18, and if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So Lord, that's our prayer this morning. As we open your word, as we apply your word to our lives. Holy Spirit, would you teach us? Would you encourage us? Would you inspire us? And would you help us as we walk through life, trusting in you, confident that you are sovereign and you are with us and you're working for us. So Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we unpack these verses from 1 Peter, what I've discovered is Peter gives us some essential skills for walking through fire. And so we're going to do this morning, we're going to unpack these, and we're going to find four essential skills for walking through fire. And the first of those skills is this, be ready and prepared. Be ready and prepared. In verse 12, Peter says, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter's saying, hey, don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. This is to be expected that you're walking through a season of testing. And Peter talks about this fiery ordeal. And that word in the Greek is pyrosis. And the first four letters, pyro, are like pyromaniac or pyrotechnic. And Peter's referencing here is these calamities or trials that the church is enduring. And he calls it a fiery ordeal. And so here's the reality, church. We know if you are a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, if you're following Jesus faithfully, you will be tested. We know that, don't we? We know that, that you will be tested. Maybe it's challenges to your faith from your friends and your family members. Maybe it's struggles in a relationship with another person because you won't compromise your Christian faith. Maybe it's you've been shut out of conversations. Maybe it's at the workplace or in your schools because of your Christian faith. And maybe you've even been mocked and ridiculed on social media because you've taken a stand on a cultural issue, but you've taken the biblical position on that issue. Anybody been there before? And so some of you, I realize today, this is your present reality. It's not that you will face, it's that you are facing that reality. And so how do we then stand strong and how do we walk through these types of fiery ordeals in our life? I think Peter gives us a great skill here. Be ready and be prepared. Be ready, he says, be ready and prepared. And I think about that idea that readiness is a state of mind, right? 
To be ready is to be a state of mind. But being prepared is actually taking intentional steps or actions to make sure that when and if something happens, I'm prepared. So let me give you an example. Let's say you and your family win tickets to the San Francisco 49ers football game against the Dallas Cowboys on October 8th. And you get 10 free tickets. And so you gather your friends and you gather your family and you get ready to go. But before you go, you look at your weather app and it says there's a 90% chance of rain. And you go, great. And you get in the car and off you go with your family and friends to enjoy this football game. And when you get there, your wife says, hey, honey, it's pouring rain. Did you bring the umbrella? And you go, oh, I forgot to bring the umbrella. Folks, being ready isn't just enough. Being prepared was, I should have brought the umbrella. Because think how miserable that game is, even if the 49ers win. I'm a Cowboys fan. Even if the, don't you judge me now, don't judge me. Don't you judge me. Even if the 49ers win, it will be a rather long day because you were ready, but you weren't prepared. So Peter's point is that we need to be ready and prepared. And so how are we readying ourselves and preparing ourselves daily? And I think the best way to do that is to make sure that our days are bathed in prayer and our days are filled with God's word. See, God's word speaks of itself. All scripture is God breathed and it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God is fully equipped for every good work. So God's word is our training manual for life to make sure that we are ready and prepared for our days. And so if you are walking through your day and you're not immersing yourself in prayer and not immersing your day in God's word, I wanna encourage you, be ready and prepared. And God's word and prayer does that for us. And skill number two is be confident in who you are and who is with you. I love these verses 13 through 16. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Verse 15, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. So what I want to clarify here is Peter's exhortation that he's specifically talking about Christians suffering because of their faith. Christian suffering because of their faith is simply that word persecution is what Peter's talking about. And persecution is simply hostility or ill treatment towards another person because of their faith. And in these verses, we see this kind of broad range, don't we, of persecution. In verse 14, Peter talks about if you're insulted. So that would be like mocking and jeering and people insulting you because of your faith. And then he talks about suffering which is the physical aspect of persecution. And that's everything from being falsely imprisoned, that's being tortured, and ultimately maybe even death. And so what we see here is this range of persecution that Peter's describing. And what we know this about persecution is this, persecution is persecution. So whether you are a 14-year-old in middle school and being mocked because you bring your Bible with you to school every day, or you are in another country somewhere and you're suffering because of your faith, Peter says, that's persecution. But Peter gives us some great hope to maintain our confidence in no matter what we're walking through. And what we see in these verses is we see this, there's a future reality that allows us to maintain confidence. In verse 13, Peter's describing about enduring this suffering because of the joy one day that we will see Jesus face to face in all of his glory. And I believe this, church, that when we see Jesus face to face, we will say every ounce, every second, every minute of suffering that I endured for your name, Jesus, is wholly worth it. 
because I'm standing here in the glory of Jesus. And that's what makes it worth it. And that's what Peter's saying. There's a future reality. And Peter also says, oh, but there's a present day reality that gives us confidence. In verse 14, it says, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. See, we're not alone when we walk through this fiery ordeal. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, the spirit of the living God is within you, rests on you. God himself, he who was, he who is, and he who is to come is dwelling inside of you. We're not alone. God himself is walking with us. And then finally, we can also look to the future with confidence. We can live in the present with confidence and we can trust that God has a plan. Why? Because Peter says, you bear his name. You're a Christian. You bear his name. You are a beloved child of the living God. And because you're a beloved child of the living God, you have an eternal family of brothers and sisters. So you don't walk alone in these fiery ordeals. And so one of the things we talk about is the fact that here at Shoreline Church, we have all kinds of ways for you to be encouraged by your brothers and sisters in Christ. So the question, church, this morning is, how are you maintaining confidence and keeping your faith in Jesus fresh? How are you maintaining confidence and keeping your faith in Jesus fresh? And one of the ways to do that is what we call here at Shoreline Church consistent community. And one of the great joys that I have as a pastor is I get to watch people take steps in getting connected in the body of Christ here at Shoreline Church. It's one of my great joys. In fact, Tuesday mornings, I love coming to work on Tuesdays. Here's why. Tuesday mornings, I show up just about the time that Pastor Dennis and his group of about 20 to 30 men are breaking up from their morning Bible study. And then I walk through the halls and then later in the morning I come downstairs and I get a chance to walk by and I see all these mothers of preschoolers, mops, and they're in there encouraging one another. They're learning about Jesus. They're encouraging one another. And then as I get ready to leave for the day, the women's Bible study is gathering. Women coming from all over Monterey County gathering to study God's word together. And then in a small room up here on the second floor, there's a group of young adult men who are gathered and they're gathering together to learn about God's word. And then in another building over there, there's another group of young adult women. Do you get, see what I'm saying here, Shoreline Church? There's all kinds of ways for us to be encouraged and grow in our confidence and our faith because we're connected to the body of Christ. And so we wanna encourage you to take those steps. And if you are someone that works in a workplace that maybe is hostile or maybe even really difficult for you to work, I wanna encourage you to look for another believer in Jesus Christ, to find another believer and to become a prayer partner with them, to pray together, to meet together, to encourage one another. In fact, I got to see the reality of how important this is. My wife, Amy, is a school teacher in one of our local schools. And she came home one day and she said, honey, there's another Christian teacher And guess what we're doing now? We're getting together and we're praying together. And I have to tell you, she was beaming that day. She was on fire. I mean, in a good way. She was beaming. And honey, I know you're radiant always, but you are especially beaming that day because she'd been with another believer and prayed together. So I want to encourage your church to maintain, to encourage you to build those relationships with other believers, to be encouraged. Skill number three is to stay humble and stay on mission. Verses 17 and 18 say, for it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? I think Peter here, there's this two-part challenge. I think number one, Peter was reminding the believers, that they were in a season of testing by God. And that testing was in order to purify the church so that God could do even more through the church in the days, years, and decades to come. And Peter was encouraging them to be faithful, stand strong, stay humble. And Peter also, I think there was a second part, was he was lighting the fire 
He was really fanning the flame of the gospel to remember that we are called by Jesus to go and make disciples. No matter what we're facing, we're called to go and make disciples. And so how did the church respond in AD 60, AD 64, somewhere in that time frame when Peter wrote this? How did they respond? Christians faithfully modeled Jesus' love by caring for, praying for, and sharing the gospel with the same people that were persecuting them. The same people. And so in one generation, what we saw is these small churches, of, these gatherings of Christians, that they gathered together, but they didn't just insulate themselves. They shared and cared. Here's a picture. We're going to show you the first century church. This is at the end of 100 AD. These churches would meet, and then they would pray together to share the gospel. I want you to look. Here's the next picture. Second century. Look what the church is doing. It's growing from primarily Jerusalem across into Europe, and then look at by third century. Look at the number. Each dot, each red dot represents a church. It represents families. It represents believers who shared the gospel and cared for their neighbors, loved people one family at a time, one person at a time. And church, we are so blessed today because of the faithfulness of those churches way back then. Do you ever think about that? Because they were faithful way back then. Today, we can gather and worship Jesus together. And so how did they do it? How did they do it? In the face of horrific persecution, they did it by loving people in Jesus' name, by sharing the gospel intentionally and with a sense of urgency. And so now that the baton has been passed to us, church, the question for us then is, how are we praying? How are you praying and reaching out to those who are not yet followers of Jesus? And so I want to encourage you this week, maybe even today, that you would spend some time with God. Just get alone with God and ask God, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, ask God to show you one person in your life that's particularly hostile to the gospel, particularly hostile to Christianity. And then what I want to do is, as you get that name, I want you to pray and ask God to in give you some steps that you can take to help build a bridge so that you could share the gospel with that person. And I don't know what that is for you. I don't know who that person is for you, but God does. And so once God gives you that name and God gives you those steps, as you think through those steps, I wanna encourage you to put it in your phone or to write down their name and write down those steps. And then the fourth part is you're gonna share that with another person so that they can pray for you and hold you accountable and to ask you, hey, how'd that conversation go? Or how are you connecting? How are you intentionally loving that person? And that's one of the ways we can do it. One person at a time. So we think about the fourth skill is trust God and do good. I love that, trust God and do good. In verse 19, it says, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. I love that. Commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So Peter gives us, how do we respond when somebody insults us? How do we respond when we have to deal with mocking or somebody is ostracizing us because of our faith? The first part is trust God. And that word commit means to fully offer or entrust ourselves to God. And I love how Peter uses these two words, faithful creator. Isn't that a beautiful reminder? Faithful. We think of God's faithfulness, his love, enduring generation, generation, generation. God is faithful. Oh, but God is also powerful because he says, commit to our faithful creator, the powerful, all-knowing all-powerful, almighty God. And that should encourage us. And so how do we stand strong then in our faith? How do we walk through fire? First, we have to commit to God. We have to trust him. He's sovereign. My question is not to ask why, God. 
Mine is to ask, Lord, how would you have me respond to this situation? So we can trust our faithful creator. And the second part of that is keep doing good. Do you see that? Continue to do good. Notice that Peter didn't say you fight fire with fire. What do we do instead? We shower it with love. We shower it with love. And that's Peter's point. Continue to do good. Though they insult you and mock you, you keep showing the love of Jesus. Maybe they isolate and avoid you. You keep praying for opportunities to connect with that person. Maybe they refuse your invitation to even come to church. Keep inviting, keep inviting. Or maybe they reject the gospel. We keep showing the love of Jesus and sharing the gospel as the spirit leads. We keep continuing to do good. And I'm reminded of this that my wife and her parents, they prayed for me for seven years. I was not a Christian when I got married, and some of you know my story. Some of you know my testimony. But my wife and her parents and her family prayed for me for seven years, and they kept doing good. They kept loving me, encouraging me. They kept doing good. And so just because you may not see signs of hope, it doesn't mean that God's not working on the inside. You keep doing good. Keep doing good. And that's Peter's point. And one of the other ways that we can do good is to remember that we also are part of a global family of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that are walking through their own fiery ordeals. And some of the ways that we can, we can do that is we can be mindful of the fact that every day that there are increasing numbers of attacks on churches. And Pastor Dennis prayed and Greg Kelly talked about Pakistan. But even though we're seeing increasing number of attacks on Christians globally, we're seeing an increasing number of believers in Jesus Christ, increasing number of churches that are expanding around the world. And I believe that's fulfillment of Jesus' word. He said, I will build this church and even the gates of hell will not prevail. And we get to be part of that church. And we get a chance to build churches by equipping and strengthening and encouraging and praying for and supporting believers around the world. We're going to show you a picture up here of a map. And this picture represents the 1040 window. That is 10 degrees latitude and 40 degrees north latitude. And you'll see the area in between the two black bars is those are the areas that are most hostile to the gospel, that are most restricted to Christians and the most dangerous to Christians. That's called the 1040 window. And so what we need to be asking ourselves is why does it matter that these areas of the world are undergoing persecutions? Why does it matter to me and why should I care? Let me read for you the words of Hebrews 13, three. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. The writer of Hebrews here is saying, put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in their position. Continue to remember them. That's pray for them. Support, encourage, whatever it takes, we have to remember. And so one of the things that we ask then is how can you engage in praying, partnering, and serving other believers who are walking through fire? How can you pray partner, support these other believers. Well, for some of you, when you came in, in fact, I hope all of you, when you came in today, you received a bookmark. And on the front is the Stand Strong. This is our sermon series. But on the back are some specific prayer directions of how we can be praying for the global church, how we can be praying for our brothers and sisters around the world who are enduring persecution. And you'll see those scriptures on there. And for those of you who are watching online, you can actually go onto our website. We've got a digital version of this. Now, some of you may not read books anymore, but what you can do is place this by your nightstand, place this somewhere in your home, place this where you can see it, maybe even in your car. And as you go to work, just say, today I'm gonna pray 
for the believers that they would sense God's presence. And you just pray that on your way into work. But being more intentional about praying for our brothers and sisters around the world. And also the other side is how can I be more active in partnering and supporting the global church? And so today, if you came today to Shoreline Church, this is a wonderful day because today is actually our global missions fair. And so when you walked into the courtyard today, you saw these different uh, tents that were set up out there and there's all kinds of opportunities and ways for you to partner and support the global church. And I just wanna share a couple of those. We have an organization that was actually birthed and founded here at Shoreline Church called Organic Outreach International. And Organic Outreach International goes around the world and particularly they're really focusing on that 1040 window to help equip and train leaders, church leaders and pastors in sharing of the gospel. And that's Organic Outreach International. And they're out there in the courtyard today. It might be bringing God's word. I wanna really bring God's word. And so as, as Dennis shared, we have the today, you can go by our world mission. There's an area out there where world mission, this is the treasure. This is the solar powered audio Bible. That world mission that Shoreline Church sponsors every year, every month we're sponsoring to send more of these over. And these solar powered audio Bibles actually come in the native tongue of the people that we bring them to. And so for around $50, we can send one of these, that covers the equipment and the distribution, around $50, we can send one of these to one of those areas around the world where people are undergoing persecution to help equip them and inspire them in God's word. And maybe it's supporting underground churches and persecuted believers. Maybe that's something you're passionate about. Well, we have two organizations out there. One is called Voice of the Martyrs and the other is Global Christian Relief. And these two organizations are specifically geared towards in, to help and support those Christians that are in areas that are most hostile and restricted, like Afghanistan, North Korea, Iran, those places. And these organizations minister to those believers in those places. And then lastly, today is a unique opportunity in that we have a group of Compassion International children, we have packets out there. Compassion International is an organization that specifically is founded on the principle of helping meet children's need that are in most in poverty. These are children that are in the deepest levels of pottery, poverty, excuse me. And these children, these children, not only are they, when we sponsor a child, they're given meals, they're given food. They're also given an education, given skills so that they can become contributors to society and to the world. And also, most important, they're given the message of Jesus Christ, the hope that is the gospel. And so Pastor Ben shared one of the packets with me this morning. This is a little girl named Angie. And Angie is from Rwanda. Angie turns five in December. And Angie, unfortunately, has been waiting for a sponsor for more than 297 days, almost 300 days, waiting for a sponsor to bring hope in Jesus' name to her life and her family. And so for Compassion International, $43 a month is basically what it costs to sponsor a child. And so I wanna encourage you today, any one of these opportunities, and there's many, many more opportunities out there, but I wanna encourage you to think about ways that you can intentionally partner with and support believers, especially those believers who are undergoing the most dangerous, living in the most dangerous areas and enduring the harshest persecution. So when I ask church as we close is what is your next step? What is your next step? And so how do we walk through fire? How do we stand strong in our faith? We take it day by day Step after step, trusting in Jesus and committing to follow him no matter what we're facing. Amen, church? Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are Lord of all. You're Lord of the church and you're Lord of our lives. And so Jesus, this morning, I pray for each one of us that as your holy word does, that it equips us and inspires us and that it transforms us by your spirit. I pray that each one of us would take whatever step you're calling us to take this morning. 
May we be found faithful as the church was way, way back many, many years ago as they faithfully responded to your call. So Jesus, we love you and we thank you again. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sean. Excellent. So before we go, I got some uh, words to share with you about what's going on here. And this is a busy, busy church, and I love it. So one thing I'm going to point out that we are built by God to have deep, rich, meaningful, purposeful lives. And, and we follow him and we find out what those are. So in the end of Matthew chapter 28, we find the Great Commission. All authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and baptize all nations in the name of the Father and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And surely I will be with you always until the end of the age. That's the last words of Jesus. How do we do it? Acts 1.8. We'll receive power. We are to be as witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we're it. We're the delivery system. So I want to encourage you today. Go out and visit those booths, and just with an open heart, and let God speak to you and prompt you and if you're already engaged, to nourish and encourage you. But if not, just be open. Maybe today is the day that you get involved. So I want to point out something else coming up. Wednesday night is our night of worship. It's a beautiful experience. It, believers come, shoreline people come, and we dig deep. We, we sing our hearts out. We pray. We take communion together. It's a wonderful time. Don't miss it. It's, it's so good to be here. So I want to encourage you to come. Now, if you'd like prayer, I gotta, we have prayer teams, people who love to pray with other people. They'll be here and they'll be here. I'll be over there and these guys are here and we love to pray. Don't hesitate if something's on your heart to, to uh, receive prayer for. God calls us to do that. And then if you're new today, first of all, if you're new and in here, please go ahead and go to the Connection Center. Let them know who you are. Ask questions. We have a free gift for you. And if you're online and you're new, all right, you can text the number on the screen for the digital connection card. Um, we just want to get to know you. We want to have that sense of community available to you if you're not already engaged. So before you go, I'd love it if you please stand. I want to send you out with a word of blessing. There's an old saying, you got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything right? I encourage you, go out today with a determination to stand for Christ, to stand for the scripture, to just take what comes at you side to side and band together in strength and make a difference for his sake in the world. God bless you. Go and enjoy the rest of the day.